Hiya folks, the old fossil here. This video is about decoding shaft encoders. Uh, if you want to know more about shaft encoders, the Wikipedia article is very good. It tells you almost everything you want to know except how to decode them. So I got a little encoder from Amazon for $5 and all it is is two cross switches. The data sheet says the switches bounce for two milliseconds. You can spin it 100 RPM if you want to use it as a, a speed pickup. Uh, and it makes 24 pulses per revolution. This is the Wiki Wikipedia page. It's a very good article. This is the data sheet for the little encoder. Like I say, $5 is not very much. Now, quadrature, uh, the, the, the classical quadrature signals are sine and cosine. You're 90 degrees out of phase. Uh, the little switch closures just essentially digitize those two. Now, if you look at the overlaps, I, I arbitrarily made the in-phase channel value bit 1 and the quadrature channel uh, value bit 2 so that if you use them as, as binary numbers, the states are numbered as shown uh, 3102 depending upon which switch is closed and which is not. If there are if it has 24 pulses per rev, and each pulse has four identifiable states, that's 96 pulses, 96 states total per rev, which comes out to 3.75 degrees resolution. Now, I'm only trying to make a steerable radio antenna, so four degrees resolution is plenty. It's not a telescope. If you want to increase the resolution, just put a little gear train in front of it, uh, turn the encoder more than once for a revolution of whatever you're picking up. You can divide the resolution by whatever the gear train ratio is, but be aware gear trains come with their own set of problems like uh, backlash and end play and all sorts of things. I didn't feel like messing with that. This is just the, the basic one turn per rev. This is a, a schematic of the little breadboard I used. Uh, it's very simple. The incremental encoder is just two switches, an I and Q channel, a couple of capacitors to uh, squelch some of the switch bounce. Uh, the, the I and Q channels go straight to the interrupt pins on the uh, Metro Mini. Oh, I use the internal pull-ups in the Metro Mini instead of the resistors as shown here. This is a picture of the actual hardware again, it's not really very much. Now the code is basically interrupt driven. Uh, whenever either one of the switch lines has a change in it, that means the encoder has moved. And the, uh, the decoder processes the switch positions to decide which way and how much. The code is uh, standard C++ uh, Arduino code starts off with this little picture of the actual waveforms for clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. Then uh, the global definitions of pins and variables and so forth. The uh, setup routine defines the pins, uh, begins the serial and attaches the interrupts to the two interrupt pins. Uh, the 
loop routine is really only one function, the, the decoder. The other three functions as shown are, are commented out. They don't actually execute. They were very useful during the debug phase. Uh, quadrature fabricates two waveforms similar to what the encoder does, just so you have a steady, reliable test source. Uh, time is just a little time base so that you can make the period of the quadrature signal whatever you want. And blink is uh, blink forever. Uh, I just use that to give me a warm feeling that the thing is still running when it's lying there. Interrupts are a little bit like guns. They'll go off at any time they feel like it, whether you're ready for it or not. The code has to handle the interrupt whenever it occurs. So the interrupt handler in the code is very, very short. The first thing it does is disable further interrupts because you don't want switch bounce or anything else to start spurious responses. Let's handle the one that happened first with the interrupts turned off. The first thing it starts off with is a delay. Uh, it's one millisecond here because between the capacitors to damp things and the spec value of two milliseconds is a maximum, one millisecond seems to work adequately. The, the whole function is enclosed in an if condition if an interrupt has occurred. Let's do it one, do it two. Uh, the first thing it does after the delay to let the switch bounce out is read the state of the switches, uh, I and Q, and from that determines which state it is. The or if conditions just do a binary decode to determine the state. Oh, by the way, before you get to state this time, you have to save what the old state was so you know where it came from. Now, the next thing you do is determine which direction the turn was. So depending upon what the new state is now and what the old state was, you can determine whether the motion was the clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, warm feeling output is you can print, serial print everything that happened. Uh, and finally down at the bottom, reset, do it, and attach the interrupts again for the next motion. These are the little debug routines, time and, and quad is, generates the quadrature signals. And finally, uh, blink, I just set it up to blink on even seconds from the time base. And the two interrupt handlers, like I said, the first thing they do is stop the interrupts. Uh, do it one, do it two, so you can tell whether the interrupt was on the in-phase channel or on the quadrature channel, but really it doesn't matter. The uh, decoder works with either one. So this is what the answers look like. Uh, I just took my fingers and turned the little encoder one full turn clockwise and then back counterclockwise. Now, it's a very small device and it's a small shaft. So as I started turning it up, your hand gets halfway around and release it and turn your hand back over and grab it again. When I grabbed it again, I bumped it a little bit. And you can see very clearly in the middle, it turned backwards a little teeny bit. And then I turned it the rest of the way up. On coming back, I just spun it in my fingers without letting it go. And it came all the way back smoothly. But it's very responsive and it works fine. The, the top graph is the accumulated position. And you can see it just goes up, comes back down, goes up to 88, not 94, because I didn't turn it quite 360 degrees. Uh, the middle graph is the state. And you can see the progressions of the states all the way up and all the way back. And at the bottom, the interesting thing is this is the direction of rotation. So there you go. Uh, it works fine. 
Uh, like I say, I'm planning on using it for a steerable radio antenna. I'm going to need two channels, uh, one for elevation and one for azimuth. But that's another video. Thanks for watching.